Welcome to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I speak with digital capture specialist, George Brooks. George owns and operates his Los Angeles-based digital capture company called Brooks Digi, which specializes in digital capture, post-production, and other digital image-related services. George has worked with photographers and brands such as Mark Seliger, Alexandra Gavalette, Dana Scruggs, Billboard, and Nike, to name a few. In this interview, I speak to George about studying photography at NYU, what led him to pursue a career as a digital tech, and his experience working with Mark Seliger on the Vanity Fair Oscars photo booth. And I also speak to George about building his first computer at the age of eight years old. When working on commercial photo shoots, the digital tech is such a key component to having a successful shoot. So I was really excited to speak with George about his journey with photography and digital tech work. So I hope you enjoy and thanks so much for listening. All right, George Brooks, a.k.a. Brooks Digi. Uh, welcome to the podcast, man. My first uh, digital tech or how do, how do you go by it? Digital capture specialist or what? how do you title it? Uh, usually digital tech, digi tech, tech, you know, that, those are kind of the, the usuals. But yeah, thanks for having me, man. This is my uh, first time being a guest on a podcast, too. It's something I've always wanted to do. So uh, I like really it. Man. Honored to be among yeah. a bunch of really cool names, people I really admire. So uh, appreciate yeah, it. I appreciate it, man. Well, let's get let's get straight to it, George. All right. Uh, let's get to the question. All the people want to know, Canon or Nikon, what are you going Ooh. with? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I don't want to catch any hate here. Um <laughs> I personally, I'm a Canon guy. Um, yeah. That's kind of what the market's like out in LA. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd say like 90% of my clients are Canon shooters. So that's just kind of the system I've, I've been, I've, I've been using and had for many years. Um, no hate for the Nikon. I think the D850 is an awesome camera. Um, you know, I, I like the Sony's a lot. I, I like the Fuji. I really like phase one. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of a, an equal opportunity camera user, but I'd say majority of the jobs are shot on Canon. No, definitely. Uh, have you messed around with the can- the new Canon R five at all? Because everyone, I have. Thought, what's your what what's your take on that? Because I was interested. I was excited to talk to you because, like I said, setting this up. I'm not like a gear nerd so much. So y- talking to you, that's your your lane. Like you, you're very knowledgeable in that stuff. I was just kind of curious your opinion on like the R five and mirrorless and why people should shoot mirrorless or if not, I guess. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, I, I will say for the last like three or four years, as mirrorless has been coming up, I've, I've been pretty resistant to it. Um, like a lot of the photographers I work with, I haven't been a huge fan of the electronic viewfinder. I think that's really like mm-hmm. the main thing that, that people point out as, as what's kind of holding them back from switching. Um, so the R5 was the first mirrorless system that I personally bought. I, I bought it a few months ago um, and I've been putting it out on jobs ever since. Um I obviously had used a lot of the Sony mirrorless cameras and some of the Fuji mirrorless cameras before, you know, they, they have their pros and their cons. Um, but you know, for Canon shooters and people coming from 5d Mark four or 5ds, um, I think, um, if you were a little hesitant to switch to the Sony mirrorless system, give the R5 a try. Cause I think you're really going to like it. It's going to feel really familiar, uh, ergonomically. Um, I, I think the biggest thing about it that I've been kind of pushing to, to my clients is that I think just the sensor in that camera is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got a ton of dynamic range. You can really push the ISO. Um, the color is really nice and natural. You know, a lot of older Canon cameras have this kind of red tint or they don't handle like really saturated blues really well. Um, but I've had the R5 in a lot of different situations at this point. And the thing that's like consistently been blowing me away is how amazing the color is. Um, so, you know, for, for most photographers, that's like the one thing that they really care about is like, how's the color? I really got to have that color. And, um, you know, I know a few people who have not been super satisfied with their 5d, especially the 5d S. Um, okay. and that's the, the main thing I've really been pushing them is like, Hey man, like you can, you can get over the electronic viewfinder. You'll get used to it, but you got to use this camera. Cause you're just going to love the color and the sharpness. Why, what is it? Cause I like the, with the mirrorless, why do they have the EVFs? Is it this, uh, what, why do they use the EVFs? I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, so if you think about like how a DSLR works, the, the optical viewfinder is reflecting off the mirror, right? Mm-hmm. So when you take that mirror away, um, there's no real way to give you like a through the lens mm-hmm. view with, without it being an electronic viewfinder showing you what the sensor seeing. I guess the only real alternative would be to have like a, a range finder set up where you yeah. have an optical viewfinder that that's not, uh, that's <laughs> offset. That's not through the lens. And I mean, you know, I, there's benefits and 
pros and cons to that too. But I think that, um, you know, ha- having that through the lens view is really important yeah. uh, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. I messed around. My buddy bought the, uh, the Fuji GFX 100, which is a beast of a camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has an EVF. I mean, I- have you messed around with that camera at all? Yeah. I really, really like that camera a lot. Um, I've done maybe four or five shoots with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like looking at your part of your website, obviously you you work on set, but then uh, you also like rent out your gear. Is that something you kind of been doing like since you started your business pretty much renting out gear like packages and whatnot? Yeah, that is something I've been doing since the very beginning. But the reason I started doing that from the from day one was like purely out of naivete. Like most techs do not start out owning or renting out their own gear. Um, I was young and stupid and thought that, you know, I, I, I didn't, I we'll get into this a little later. I'm sure when you start yeah. asking me how I got into teching, but, yeah. um, you know, I kind of, I kind of fell into this job by accident. Um, and it was, I mean, such a blessing. Cause it's like, I, I think I was born to do this, but, um, my very first job teching, the client wanted to rent a laptop and a monitor from me. And I happened to already have like the highest end laptop and a nice monitor just for my own photo work. So I just kind of had that assumption like, oh, digital text rent out gear too. Great. Um, so I started buying kit pretty early and, you know, six years down the road, um, the equipment rental is kind of my main source of income, which is great. Um, but, you know, most techs, I think, start out maybe owning like a laptop and a couple little accessories, but, you know, nobody is going to buy an innovative card on day one. You don't need to buy a bunch of ISO monitors on day one. So I always encourage young techs who are coming to me saying like, what kit should I buy? Um, I tell them, look, go find a rental house, like make a, make friends with them. Um, And, you know, they'll usually give you nice deals on sub rentals and you can turn around and build your client full price and, and um, you know, keep the profit for yourself and put that aside. And that's what you should use to build your kit. So if I could go back and do it all over again, I think I would have like not bought anything for the first couple of years and, and gone more that route. And I'd probably have a little more money in the bank right now, but, um, <laughs> but no, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I am kind of a rental house too, because I've always had really bad gear acquisition syndrome and um, you know, I'm going to buy all this gear anyway. So it's nice that it's a write off and I can make money on it. Um, yeah. You feel like that's part of your job. Cause like you, when people come to you, they come to you because of your knowledge of technology and like, like staying up to date, what the new technology is. Like, do you feel like you have to constantly kind of keep updating your kit? Like you said, you got the R5 and mm-hmm. you kind of have to keep offering like new products and stuff for clients pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's a balance for sure. I, I think that that, you know, being up to date on, on kid is definitely a huge part of it. Um, I think like personality is also a huge part of, of why r- really anyone gets hired, but especially tax and assistance. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to stay up to date on stuff and, you know, you don't want to be sending out old broken laptops and cameras and stuff that aren't going to perform because that's not a good look. But I think that it's also a balance of figuring out uh, what people actually are going to rent from you and what you're going to make money on. Um, and like, you know, like we were saying at the beginning, I'm a Canon guy because all my clients are Canon people. And mm-hmm. I would love to own an icon system too. And I know a lot of techs that do own both, but I, I probably do, you know, less than 15 Nikon jobs a year. A lot of those photographers already own those cameras. So as much as I want that system, it's just not, I'm not going to make a profit on it. And at the end of the day, you know, I am running a business here and got to think about the bottom line. So, um, you know, sometimes going to a rental house and sub renting those yeah. kind of things makes more sense. Um, but you know, with, with, within the confines of what I know my clients are going to like and what I know is going to be going out on jobs. Um, yeah, I, I try and keep everything really up to date. Like I, I pretty much always buy the new laptop every year. Um, I'll buy whatever new Canon camera comes out, or if there's like a new version of a lens, those are things that are pretty reliably going to work. Yeah, I was reading through your old blog last night. Uh, it was like a post from like probably like 2017 or 2018. And, and you you had just bought the new Mac Pro when they had the, uh, what do they call it? The uh, like touch bar. Where you oh, can, yeah, yeah. I was like, you the- were a, I, see, I was on the same boat. Like when I, I just bought the new Mac Pro uh, laptop, like back in may or something and it was the first touch bar one i had and i was like i don't think i'm gonna like this and it kind of I, I love it dude i think it's great me too man yeah i was in the same boat i i was really a holdout i i didn't get it until the second generation came out and le- pretty much like any laptop i've ever bought i, tr- I was like nah, i can get by with my old one and then a friend like had the new one and showed me how fast it was and i was like oh shit man <laughs> like gotta get that 
uh, I'll adapt, whatever. And, you know, it, the USB-C dongle thing, mm-hmm. um, I think has really been a blessing in disguise because with the old system, you know, I was limited to two USB ports and two Thunderbolt ports and an HDMI and that's it. And if I was on location somewhere without power and had to run like four client drives or like more than two monitors or anything like that, there wasn't much you can do, but it's so nice now that you've got these four ports that you can adapt to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And I've basically taken like all the hubs and everything out of my location kits because with, you know, various like combinations of dongles, I can run pretty much any setup that I need. Um, And yeah, it's been fantastic. I mean, I'm excited for the transition that's coming with Apple Silicon too. I think there's big things on the horizon with, uh, Apple and Max in general, but um, yeah, no, I mean, like anything Apple does, everybody loves to complain about it for the first six <laughs> months, and then they use it, and they're like, "Oh, how did I live without this?" You the know? only th- the only thing I missed from my old laptop is the uh, the SD card reader that was already built on the yeah, side. Yeah, totally. That's other than that, though. Yeah, I, I, the dongle thing doesn't really bother me either, but that's the only thing yeah. I, I kind of miss. But um, the biggest get- thing for me was that when they got rid of the escape key, that was huge, and I'm so glad they did bring that back with the most recent version. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole the whole touch bar itself is a different story. I think that's kind of been a flop. Honestly, I don't really see yeah. a whole lot of use for that. But um, oh, what, know, oh, this I is digress. this is this is one. I'll, I'll say one more gear pet peeve and we'll get into your history and stuff. Uh, I had the Canon 5D Mark II. And the one thing I loved about the Canon 5D Mark II on the top LCD screen, it would tell you, it would say like raw, it would give you the mm. logo and the Mark IV, they got rid of that. And mm. I kind of liked it because you could look down and just make sure like, oh, I'm in raw, I'm in raw. And right. Like, one thing I missed when they, I don't know why they switched that out. I asked like a Canon rep one time. He had like no answer for me. Oh man. Well, I will say, <laughs> don't quote me on this because I, I could be totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure that didn't go away. It just moved because now that it'll show you. It might not show you that little raw icon directly, but there is a setting you can turn on called warnings in viewfinder. Okay. And I believe there's one that will give you the little exclamation point warning if you're not in raw. Oh shit. All right. See, I'm learning I, something I already, George. Right. See, now I'm second guessing myself though. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna, gonna check on that as soon as we get off. I'm gonna be like, ah oh, shit, I gotta, <laughs> gotta email uh, Alex and tell him to cut that part out. But um, yeah, man. No, I, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. And I guess to go back, man, like where did you grow up and like how did you kind of first get into photography? Sure. Um, I hope I don't ramble here because it's kind of a long story, but I think it's interesting. But <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm in L.A. here. I grew up in the suburbs of L.A., a town called Thousand Oaks. Um, oh, yeah. I lived there when I was a kid, man. You're from Thousand Oaks? I didn't. I wasn't born there, but I lived there for like four years when I was a young child. Oh, you're kidding. No way. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So I'm from Thousand Oaks, uh, you know, grew up there from birth to 18, um, went to high school out here. And then I ended up moving uh, to the East Coast to New York for college. Uh, I went to NYU uh for four years and then four years later uh yeah sorry <laughs> went to nyu for four years and then spent an additional four years in new york working and then i moved back here about two and a half years ago in 2018 um i got into photography really young my grandfather my paternal grandfather was a photographer um he and my great grandfather owned a like small town newspaper in illinois back in the day so wow when you own your family newspaper, you do everything. You write, edit, you know, typesetting, the whole nine. But um, he was always really passionate about photography. And uh, it was never his career, but he uh, did it in college and, and it was always kind of a side thing for him. So growing up, I was always really exposed to it. And around the time I was eight or nine, uh, he pulled out his crown graphic 4 by 5 camera and took a really cool portrait of me using this old school, like double exposure silhouette technique. And I think that was the first time that I really looked at like the aspects of photography aside from just the camera itself and realized like, wow, this is a whole process. There's, there's so much more you can do with this than just the family snapshot. Um, And then around the same time, a neighbor of mine uh, upgraded his camera and gave me his old uh, 35 millimeter Minolta SLR um, and I just, you know, I brought that with me everywhere. I brought it to school. I, it, you know, it was n- always by my side. Um, I went to summer camp that year. They had a photo program that, uh, with a dark room. I got to print in a dark room for the first time. And you're like and only that, what, like eight or nine years old, eight or nine years old. Yeah. Doing my first dark room prints. I mean, and this was like in the early two thousands when digital was just starting to become a thing. And like, you know, people, the dark room, I think at that point was clearly like an obsolete thing. Like I, I had never I didn't even know what a dark room was. Like I, my mom went to CVS to get her photos developed, you know? So um, I was just absolutely hooked by that whole process. And then, I mean, really from that point up through like most of college, I was really, really focused on dark room work. 
And um, I, you know, I, I liked the dark room more than even shooting. And I found myself kind of like taking pictures so that I would have something to print. Um, and I thought that like I was going to try and make that my career. I knew that was a really niche thing at that point, but I wanted to go find like that one place that was still doing like fine art printing for big photographers. Um, and then, you know, just as, as time went on and as I started working a little bit more and like trying to get out there, uh, realizing that was kind of a, a stretch goal, um, I kind of discovered digital teching and felt like that was a pretty good, like digital equivalent of that career path. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, what, that's what, 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 uh, when you were like at NYU, like at that point, like what, what kind of stuff were you shooting photos of? And like, did you ever have like aspirations of like shooting commercially yourself or? Whoop, do you freeze there, George? Whoop. I think I lost you, George. I think, uh -huh. oh, I think oh, you froze. I'll, I'll just, I, I got you now. Um, okay, yeah, cool. I was, I was, I'll, I'll just edit it. But yeah, I was just saying, when you were at NYU, like what kind of stuff were you shooting? And like, uh, did you ever have like aspirations of like shooting or anything like that? Yeah. So um, I, I feel like a lot of your other guests have said this too, but I felt like um, being in art school and NYU was very much a fine art program and not very technical. Um, your professors kind of want you to, I mean, they don't want you to work a certain way, but there's certainly just like pretty strict guidelines that they want you to work in. And at the time, like coming out of high school, I was really into like lo-fi imagery. I was doing a lot of work with toy cameras and, and weird filters and double exposure techniques and that kind of stuff. And that really didn't fly with my professors. And they wanted me to kind of up the quality a little bit and, and make work that was a little bit more technical or technically proficient and not so like from the hip. Um, so I ended up shooting a lot of large format in college. Um, I, m at the time, my biggest influences were probably Bernard and Hilla Becker. Hmm. Um, so I was doing a lot of like multiples um, and, and projects where I was in, I was in New York City, you know, so you have this huge um, canvas to work with. And uh, I was trying to go out and find these like uh, common elements of the city and do these like, you know, grid kind of series work of that. And that was what I was doing for the first couple of years. Um, I, I did kind of in my heart of heart want, hearts want to be a commercial photographer. I think that was always kind of my end goal, but that program again was so fine art focused that I think I kind of had this, like this struggle of like, Oh, do I want to be a fine art photographer? Do I want to be a commercial photographer? How do I navigate this? Um, and I think in the midst of that kind of mental gymnastics, I realized that all my peers I was surrounded with were really like falling into this nicely and figuring it out and making really good work. And I was kind of, lagging behind that in critiques, but all those same people were coming to me with their technical questions and their Photoshop questions and their printing questions and their darkroom questions. And I think there was kind of this spark that happened where I realized like, oh, you know, there, there are two aspects here. There's the, there's the conceptual and artistic aspect of this medium. And then there's the technical side and very few people are really, really good at both. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main reasons why all these, you know, amazing photographers have lighting directors and huge crews of people that really like are doing the technical things for them because they need to focus on that artistic element. And um, that's why they're getting hired. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it's important to realize. And I'm glad I had that little realization. Yeah. Because that's kind of what pushed me down this path of like, okay, maybe I don't need to, maybe my strengths don't lie in being a p photographer per se. Maybe I want to be more of a technician. And, um, yeah, That's, definitely. You know. Definitely. Because like, as you know, like, as you're working on these huge productions, once you get starting doing bigger and bigger productions, you literally can't do everything yourself. And especially like as someone who I've just been doing freelance photography my whole career, pretty much. It's like so much of your time as photographer is like, like, obviously the creative side, building a portfolio, but then like networking building the business side and that's a whole other element of it and it's like totally there's, there's only so many hours in the day it's like so to have someone like you who is just an expert in that and other people an expert in like like styling and everything it's really just uh, a, a team effort pretty much you know totally and especially with younger photographers something i notice a lot is like people who came up with digital and 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 learned with that instant feedback mm -hmm. um i i think like taking away that necessity of really learning the technical side of lighting and exposure and all of that has like created this freedom for like younger photographers to really focus in on content and especially directing. And I think that a lot of the younger photographers I work with see themselves more as directors who are, who, who are primarily there to like get a reaction or like an, a certain 
emotion out of the talent and leave it up to the rest of us to like make sure that when that moment happens that the execution is there and that everything else is in place and um, that's something that's always really exciting to me because when I'm working in those situations I get to feel like so much more of like a part of the final product um, yeah it's, it's interesting I've noticed like uh like in the last few years I hear more and I've started hearing more of the title of like lighting technician like when I started my career 12 years ago I'd never really ever heard that title right but that's like a job now but I guess like at first I was like that's kind of weird but then now more if I think of it like you think like a like Quentin Tarantino when he makes a movie he he's not like he's building a team of people around him to like yeah. he has he knows like in his mind what he wants to look at it what what it to look like but then he puts a team around him and he like you said this kind of directs it you know yeah and he's got his gaffer and his dp and like that whole crew that's going to execute that for him and i think you know i was listening to your episode with gregory crudson recently and i think he's a really extreme example of that in like the still photography world where it's that team effort and he's really just kind of the auteur who's uh you know managing and dictating how everyone else is going to you know, come together to get that look that he wants. Um, De- definitely. And yeah, it's funny. Cause I, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're in any of these like image maker Facebook groups, but there's sometimes somebody will post something like, Hey, what's the appropriate lighting director rate. And some older <laughs> photographer will chime in and say, lighting director, what kind of photographer doesn't know how to light their own photos, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's kind of just this old school mentality. I think again, kind of back in the film days where you didn't have that instant feedback and you really had to know what you were doing to get the product. Yeah. Um, and that's just, you know, the industry's really changed. That's just not the case anymore. And um, a lot of people seem to kind of fight against that. But I, I really think that's something worth embracing. No, definitely. I, I was definitely like that, too. At first, I was like, wait, what? You just like pay some other. But then I thought about it. It's like you have an idea, whatever you need to do to get the finished product, like whatever, just make it happen mm-hmm. and like be able to like adapt and like try new stuff. Because like totally the business is just constantly <laughs> changing and stuff, you know? Yeah. And again, like everybody is going to be different. Everybody has their own way of working and and some photographers, their work really is all about the light. And, you know, those kind of people, of course, they're going to want to be their own lighting director. But um, I've just been on so many jobs where somebody who's like 20 years old has gotten this cool fashion gig. And the first assistant is like a 40 year old dude. <laughs> and he's and he's just it's so it's always kind of fun. <laughs> it's not fun to watch because it, it, it really slows you down. But um, sometimes there's these arguments over like these small technical aspects of things. And you have to remind the older people like, dude, it doesn't matter. We can fix it in post. We're, we're focusing on like on this moment right now, like, and you're distracting us. Yeah. Um, so do you feel like I was going to ask you about it? Cause when you think about like digital tech, they're like, I, I almost think of them almost like the point guard of the job in a sense, because <laughs> you, you know how it is on every job. It's like people start huddling around and that's where the conversations are happening. A lot mm-hmm. of times around like your little, like, what do you call the, the, the I'm blanking on my tech. station or my car. Yeah. A little, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, little cart station, or whatever. Uh, do you feel like it's like your job um, to like, inflect like your opinion on stuff sometimes or like how do you kind of balance that or do you kind of just let the creative do their thing and you're just executing the Mm -hmm. technical aspect i guess it's really a tough balance because i think that like yeah a lot of the reason you are there is to make sure that all those things are happening but at the same time you have to recognize that it's not your shoot and like the photographer probably also is thinking about most of those things Mm -hmm. um I, th- I think Art Stryber said it really well in his interview with you. He uh, is kind of resonated with me. He was talking about like what makes a good intern and it's kind of having that ability to like be thinking two steps ahead and anticipate, um, but also recognize, you know, when everybody else also knows what you're saying and not say that and, and not say too much. Cause you know, you don't want to steal a spotlight. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm always trying to find that balance of knowing, you know, when to call something out and when to let something slide. Um, and, and not my, one of my favorite lines on set when it is, is like, you know, I, I don't mean to art direct or anything, but, um, cause sometimes, you know, there really is something with, with clothes or with light or props or something that you, you know, is wrong and you want to call out, but you also don't want to step on that department's toes and say, you know, you're wrong. Um, but yeah, it's a tough balance. And, and when I try and describe my job to people who aren't in the photo industry, which is one of like the hardest things ever. Because <laughs> if you've never been on a big commercial photo set and you say, oh, I'm the computer guy, like nobody really has any idea what I'm really, really doing. They're like, oh, you just um, like, da- you just download photos. I do yeah. that with my, my kids' photos on my laptop. <laughs> exactly. And there's so much more to it than that. Um, 
And so I think the kind of one liner that I like to use is that I'm quality control. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody on set has their job to do. And, and the one, th- you know, the wardrobe's looking at wardrobe, the makeup's looking at makeup, lighting's looking at lighting. And I think it's kind of my job to be the last set of eyes that's looking at everything and, and point and if something is off that hasn't been called out to say, Hey, what do we think about this? You know? And again, it's the balance of, of, knowing when to do that and when not to do that um, and not doing it too much. Cause you know, at the end of the day, that's not my primary job. My primary job is to make sure that the client gets delivered a hard drive with all of the images in the right place, backed up and you know, everything as in focus and properly exposed as possible. I think that's really, really at the end of the day, the reason I'm there, yeah. but um, all these other things factor into that too. And you know, again, yeah, it's a just, lot of times it's, it's automat- you're working with people you've never met. They might just be flying into town or you're going <laughs> to some job and like you don't even know what their personality is like. So you really have to be able to kind of like read the room, know when to like totally inflect. Right. Yeah. And I think that's one of my favorite things about the job is like versus having a nine to five office jobs. I get to be in a different place with different people every day. And, you know, of course, there's clients I work with often that I have close relationships with that I, I, I do just kind of know how they work. And it's oh. Did you lose my video? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, one second. Um, yeah, we were, just saying, was, were we saying? were just saying um, uh, uh, how, like, with your job, a lot of times you're just working with people you've never met. Right. They might be flying into town, and you kind of got to be able to read the room as a digital tech and, like, know when to, like, speak up and sometimes, like, sit back, I guess. Totally, yeah. So I was saying one of my favorite things about the job versus, like, a nine-to-five office job is getting to meet new people and be in all these incredible places every day. But that can be a challenge when you've never worked with somebody before. And um, yeah, I, I, I think in those situations, I do tend to be a little bit more quiet um, because, you know, you kind of want to listen a little bit more and, and watch how those people like to work and see how that photographer is going to like react to feedback before you really want to jump in and um, be a bigger part of it. But, um, you know, it, it's, I, I really like working with photographers who are like really collaborative and, and where it is a team effort. Um, and that's always fun to find. But um, yeah, I mean, especially for me, a lot of techs really do have their like four or five solid clients that they work with all the time. They travel with them, you know, they and, th- and they don't really take other jobs. And like, those are their clients. I'm kind of the complete opposite. <laughs> um, I think part of it was coming from New York to LA. Uh, New York has a reputation, the crews in New York have a reputation of being really on point and hustling and, and, um, you know, just doing good work. Um, Obviously, crews in LA, very professional as well, know what they're doing. But I think a lot of photographers in New York are a little bit wary of working with people with like California laid back attitude and really want that hustle and drive. So especially for the first pre COVID, like first year and a half I was out here, the majority of my clients were New Yorkers who were flying in. And I think Part of that was like my network was out there. So, you know, I might have a friend who's a tech there who has one of their clients who's coming to LA and they're like, oh, you know, you don't have the budget to fly me out, but I know this guy out there. Um, Also, like we were saying with uh, me being a little bit more focused on like owning and renting equipment than some other techs, I think that also helped me attract more like out of town people who might not be flying in with their own kits, that kind of thing. Um, So, yeah, I'm constantly working with new people that I've never worked with before. And especially now that um, a lot of those cl- older clients that I had, like, aren't traveling anymore. I'm picking up more local LA clients who are new to me as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's something I'm constantly. No, nah, no, nah, it keeps to. It exciting that. Yeah. Cause it's, looking at your website, you've gotten to work on a lot of cool, obviously you do editorial stuff, commercial stuff, and it keeps it interesting. Cause I've definitely had like, you can definitely get stuck in a, in a routine of like, I've, I've done like years where you just shoot a ton of e-commerce where it's like, yeah. you know, it's good. The money keeps coming in, but like that for your creative mind, it can get really monotonous and boring, but looking totally. at the work you get to do, it seems like it keeps it kind of fresh and exciting. Uh, Cause like what kind of stuff do you like working on most? You think? I think my, I, I always love anything with celebrities. I think that's always really fun. And I just like the pace of that where it's like, go, go, go. And then hurry up and wait. And then the pressure's really on for that, like 20 minutes that you have talent and then you can cool <laughs> off a little bit. Like, that's the environment that I really like being in. Um, so I've been fortunate, especially lately, to be working on a lot of key art um, for you know film and television. Um, that's that's kind of my jam. If I could be doing more of that, um, I, you know, it's, and I, I just always like a big production with 
a, lo- a lot of people <laughs> and a it's just a fun environment to be in. So yeah, man, um, that's kind of what I'm aiming for, but I'm a total equal opportunity tech. You know, I've, I've done plenty of e-com. I've, I do lots of editorial. I've done car shoots. I've done still life. You know, I've, I've done it all. Um, and you know, that's one thing I, I tell people that I really like about my job too, is like, if I had, um, tried to have a shooting career straight out of college, um, I, my work would have to be a lot more focused. Uh, I would probably be doing one or two types of work. I wouldn't, as a younger photographer, wouldn't have the opportunities necessarily to be on all these big productions and, and see how that operates. So I've really liked the opportunities that teching has afforded me to like get on some of these really big jobs and, and um, not only see how all of that operates, but really be like a team player in, in that whole crew too and, and uh, playing a part in it. And it's really and, fun. And also like you're, that's what I'm jealous of. Like I assisted for, I wish I almost, when I got out of college, I wish I assisted for longer. I probably assisted for like five years, like full time. And then I kind of just made a decision to break off. And, uh, but your knowledge of like getting to see so many different types of photographers and work so many different clients, your knowledge of like lighting is like, and, you just get to see so many different scenarios and like, who knows, maybe down the line, mm-hmm. you, you could want to start working on your own book and shoot and y- your experience of getting to be on set and see how like hundreds of different photographers work is like invaluable, pretty much. Totally. Totally. And it's always really fun too. When and this has happened a few times where you get on set and you're looking at the deck and there's a reference of like something else that you've worked on and they're like, how do we like this? I'm be like, I can tell you exactly how we look that. <laughs> you know? um, that that's, that's pretty fun too. Or, or um, you know, uh, Mark Seliger has been kind of my big name client for a long time. And, and he ends up, people love referencing, let's do Seliger lighting. Let's do it how Seliger would do it. And yeah. um, it's always fun to be like, oh, well, I think, uh, I think Mark would probably do it this way. Um, yeah. Set up so, the Octa, yeah. set up the Octa. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been really blessed to, have the opportunity to work with some really, really talented folks and, and glean a little bit of knowledge from them. Um, yeah. On that topic too, I wanted to mention, um, it, it's interesting you bring up like assisting and transitioning into shooting with that knowledge. Cause I think a lot of techs, especially assistants, but a lot of techs too, um, are, are doing it kind of as like a, a career bridge where mm-hmm. their end goal is to shoot. Um, but they do, they tech or they assist to get that onset knowledge. And yeah. I've always been a little different. Like I was saying, I've always seen, or, you know, for my career, at least since college, I've seen myself more as a technician than an artist. And I don't really have much of a desire to be a commercial photographer. I yeah. mean, may, maybe like 20 years down the road, but um, it's not my end goal. I would much rather like own a rental house or something like that. So you're um, smart, man. You're busy. Yeah. Man. Everyone else has got dreams of like <laughs> shooting. Right. Stuff. Yeah. And it's- don't get me wrong. That, that's like an amazing career. And, and the people who want to do that, I think it's great. But I, I have always really liked the aspect of my job where like I go in, I do the job, I go home and I'm done and I move on to the next one. I've, I've always kind of struggled with pre-production and post-production. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of the main force for me. But I, I think like having that mentality about it, too, is my, my clients really like that because. Um, not only do they recognize that I've gone like really deep with this, but also I think a lot of people are wary of like their assistants or their techs trying to kind of, you know, schmooze their clients on mm-hmm. set. And that's just not something I'm ever going to do. Cause I have no desire to like shoot for this client. Like the, the most I'm ever going to push it is like, Oh, let me know if you need a retoucher, you know? Yeah. So no, definitely. And I think it just goes back to there's so many different like uh, paths you can take in this industry. And there's you could be like a photo editor, you could be a digital tech, you can be a retoucher. And there's this, uh, you know, there's just so many different things you can do and like lanes you can go down, you know? Totally. Um, and I, I don't think that like schools teach that enough either. Um, I think that's something that's really important to recognize for young people who, you know, see themselves wanting a career in this industry, but don't really know where they fit in. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, another thing I think that's important to recognize, I, th- I think it was Andrew Hetherington, who's a client of mine who was talking about this on your podcast. About, Great guy. Um, love Heather. Yeah. Love Andrew. He is, I, uh, Andrew, if you hear this, I can't <laughs> wait to work with you again once we can travel. But, um, he was talking about how he, uh, initially thought he had, a, he wanted to be a fashion photographer and he realized that fashion photographers really like live and breathe fashion. They're passionate about fashion first. And I think that really applies to like anything that you want to do with photography in any role, you know, wardrobe stylists are going to be really passionate about fashion. Um, So I think people who shoot entertainment are usually pretty passionate about film and television and, or, or music or whatever, you know, um, entertainers they're shooting. So for me, 
I was always a nerd growing up. Like <laughs> I love to tell people that I built my first computer the same year I got my first camera, uh, wow. which is true. Um, so, you know, I, I think when I discovered this role on set, it was kind of like all these things that I had always been passionate about coming together into this like one thing. And, you know, I still like love computers and technology. And I think that that's kind of the driving force behind what like keeps me motivated to get up every morning and do this. So, yeah. you know, I think it's so important for young photographers to identify like what they're passionate about outside of photography and like bring that into their work. And maybe even, you know, if you're considering like where to go for school or what to study, like don't study photography, study that other thing that you really like. Cause you know, you can, especially nowadays, like anyone can learn photography on their own, but on YouTube or by assisting other people, or whatever. Like if I could do college all over again, like I, I don't have any regrets per se, but I probably wouldn't study photography. What you know, do you like, think? I, what do you think you go for? Like computer engineering or something? Maybe something like that. Um, I also, sorry, mom, but I probably maybe would have skipped college. <laughs> um, I feel like I, my, I skipping college was not an option for me. Like I, I was always expected to go to college just based on like the high school I went to and, and my parents, that was, yeah. a, that, that would not have been an option. Yeah. But um, I look at a lot of my friends who are the same age as me and do what I do, who, who just started working straight out of high school. And I feel like having that onset experience earlier on really pushed them ahead. And, you know, college is a great four years to be allowed to like make mistakes and learn from your mistakes without having the pressure of like a client who's paying you. But um, I think if I had maybe started out a little bit lower on the totem pole a little bit earlier and had that progression onset, I might be a little bit further along today. I don't know. Because when you were at NYU, were you kind of like assisting in digital teching while you were in school or like how did, how did you kind of first like start working commercially as a digital tech? Yeah, great question. I, I was hoping we'd get to this. So um, I was assisting in school. I started, I started really like freshman year. Um, taking some light assisting jobs. Obviously, pay was terrible, sometimes unpaid things. Like, I just wanted experience. So I was doing some assisting. Um, I think it was junior year. I got hired to assist on an e-com shoot through a friend. And I got there, and they had two sets set up. And it was like a three- or four-day shoot. And they said, um, hey, you know, we, we actually need a, a second digital tech for our still life set. Or do you want to do it? And I said, what's a digital tech? <laughs> and um, they said, oh, you know, you just... Uh, you, you tether the camera in, you watch Capture One, make sure everything's in focus. What's Capture One? <laughs> I was a Lightroom guy at the time. And uh, while you did not teach Capture One and still does not. Wow, um, wow that's cool. That's yeah, my feeling, dude. I actually, uh, I was supposed to, uh, I think today, actually, I was supposed, or next week, I was supposed to go in and do a Capture One demo for one of their lighting classes. I, I do that for them sometimes because nice. uh, a lot of the internships like require it. But yeah, anyways, um, I digress. So uh, the they said, bring your laptop tomorrow. I said, no problem. I didn't know what a kit rate was. <laughs> um and the other digital tech that was there sat me down and gave me kind of a five minute overview of Capture One, which I picked up really quickly because I, you know, kind of had that background computer knowledge and, uh, you know, just kind of went from there and I loved it. I was having a blast. And that tech was like, hey, man, wow, you, uh, you have some promise here. I shoot as well. Do you want to tech for me um, on my shoots? And I said, yes, absolutely. So that was really cool to have like a, a legit digital tech, like teaching me as he was shooting, because he could play that role, the photographer and be like, you know, now I want you to tell me this or do this for me. Um, and then after a little bit of that experience, uh, one of my friends in college, Alexandra Gavile, who's still one of my um, favorite clients to work with. And we're, we're really, we work really closely. Um, she started getting a little bit more commercial work herself as a student. Um, and hired me to tech on those jobs. I did it for free because I wanted the experience. And um, yeah, it all just kind of went from there. So um, yeah, I, I started seeking tech work in college. And then, uh, you know, straight away when I graduated, kind of made the decision. I, I was shooting a little bit still. I was doing some like event work and mm -hmm. some assisting still. Um, but by the time I graduated, I was pretty, pretty sure that being a full-time digital tech was like the career that I wanted to have. So I was starting to get more of those jobs and push push for that yeah no it's awesome and like for people that are interested who maybe you are interested in pursuing a career as a digital tech like what are like some important skill sets they should have if they want to uh, do this as a as a living you think good question um i mean first and foremost like knowing capture one in and out very important don't want to overlook that um i think one of the biggest things that i had going for me that i see a lot of younger techs um having a little bit less proficiency in is like mac os and just computing in general 
Um, like I said, I always had kind of a background in computers and uh, my student job in college for uh, junior and senior year, I was the digital lab TA at NYU. So I was responsible for maintaining like 50 computers and doing all the software updates and, um, you know, calibrating all the monitors, cleaning all the print heads, like just doing all the computer maintenance. And uh, I, I took, I really loved that job and I took it really seriously. So I actually ended up like coming to the photo department and saying, Hey, you know, rather than buying all new computers, let's like upgrade all these Mac pros you have. So I ended up like rebuilding all of their computers and, um, we'd have to work with the IT department to do these like really complicated software updates because of their like, you know, multi-license management. So I, I had this like really deep knowledge of like managing Mac OS. And I think that's really helped me just even being able to do like basic terminal commands and that kind of thing. And I think, um, you know, when I, when I speak with other digital techs who are really good techs, who I really look up to, um, that's one of the areas that I see kind of lacking. And I think that when you're really in those situations on set where shit's hitting the fan and you need to do troubleshooting, like having that Mac OS knowledge is really important. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the main skill I would recommend people look into. I think also ob obviously having a really good understanding of how exposure works and like F stops and, and um, really quickly being able to calculate like, okay, I need to, you know, we're shooting strobe. I need to keep the shutter speed the same, but I need to open up two stops to come down with the light two stops, like knowing how to do those kind of changes and like keep the same exposure at a different F stop and ISO. Like those things are really, really important to just like know like the back of your hand. Um, and do you feel like it's still, it's important to also know, cause I've, I've worked on so many sets where like a pro photo, like one of the bulbs break or like the pack. And it's just kind of mm -hmm. knowing like the nuances of all that, like lighting equipment too, is part of your job. I think that's important to have in the back of your head, but uh, that's maybe one of those situations where it's also important to know when to stay in your lane. And mm -hmm. like, you know, if you have a really good first assistant on your job, they probably also know that stuff and it's yep. probably going to annoy them if you're the one trying to solve that issue, if they also know how to solve it. So true. I like that. I do know, you know, obviously I know a lot about lighting too. I do some lighting direction, um, but I, I try and kind of reserve that knowledge until it's really necessary until it's a situation where I see that like, what everyone else is, is doing is not working and I need to step in just because we're on a schedule and we need to make this happen. But, um, you know, I, I try and stay in my lane a little bit more and, and focus more on the camera and computer issues first and foremost. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing I was excited to talk to you about is this like data management and like, what's your kind of workflow? Cause it's something I've been researching a lot. Cause as a photographer, the more and more you shoot, you're building more and more photos. Like what's your workflow in terms of like backing up work? Is there any advice you have for like, I don't know, archiving or what's your kind of process? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start off by saying that my workflow is different than the workflow that I recommend for photographers who are managing large archives. So yep. for me, like I do archive all of my clients work. That's just a kind of standard service that I provide minimum 90 days. Um, that has come in handy many times to like, you know, re-deliver files to clients. Um, I, be because I'm doing that kind of as an added bonus with my services, I do it as cheap as humanly possible. So what I base, I have a, a dual drive doc, like a toaster. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've seen those. And then every year, sometimes twice a year, depending on how busy I am, I'll buy um, just, well, I don't buy them as bare hard drives. I actually buy Western digital, like cheap desktop external drives. And then I rip, it's called shucking. Mm -hmm. I rip the hard drives out of those. For some reason, it's way cheaper to buy like a desktop external hard drive than a bare internal hard drive. It's like half the price for the same capacity. So Interesting. I get like two 12 terabyte drives every year, for like 150 or 200 bucks. And um, I just back everything up twice to those. And then at the end of the year, that goes in a hard drive box, goes on a shelf. Um, that's a great like long-term backup backup solution. And that is what I recommend to, for photographers to use as their secondary backups. Um, but that also is like, it's, I'm backing those files up for like long-term storage and I almost never need to access them ever again, unless, you know, something happens a year down the line. This actually just happened last week where a client requested a shoot from 2019. And I was like, yes, I still have it. And I am charging you for this, you know? Um, but uh, for most photographers, I've been recommending um, setting up an NAS system, network attached storage, so like a Synology or a QNAP. Um, and there's some really great options for those out there these days. They're really flexible in terms of like expansion. Um, 
But the, the reason I really like that is because you can have all your files in one place that you can access really quickly over fast network at home. But also if you're on a travel job halfway around the world and a client's requesting files, um, most of these systems have uh, web-based interfaces where you can connect to that drive and view and retrieve those files and send them from anywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really like the, the Synology NAS systems. I don't have one myself, but I've set a couple of my clients up with them and they've been working really well. Yeah. A side note, uh, this is, uh, I, I just read this. I figured this out. If you have an Amazon prime account, you can upload it's unlimited mm -hmm. like, cloud storage. Like literally yeah. I was, I, at first I was like, Oh, it's probably this like JPEGs. I tested it the other week, raw files. You can just upload. Totally. Much, it's crazy. Obviously that's probably not the best way to store, but it's another oh, lane. It's like, if you already have a prime account, you can store files up on there. Totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of having data in as many places as possible. So I usually recommend to people like you should have, you know, your primary RAID NAS system for your local storage and then make your second copy to the cloud, you know, and Amazon's great. Uh, Backblaze is another great option. Um, but if you can do, if you can have three copies, even better. So, and uh, what, me. what like uh, portable hard drives are you using these, d these days when obviously a lot of times I'm guessing you're into the shoot, a uh, client's going to walk away with a hard drive. Uh, which ones are you kind of liking right now? I'm a huge fan of the Samsung SSDs, the T5 and the T7. That's kind of, uh, replace the lacy rugged oh, terrible hard drives okay. as um, as the industry standard and I'm glad the prices have come down where clients are not like you know balking at SSD prices anymore um, so that that's always my first recommendation Samsung T7 um, if that is a little out of the price range I really like GTEC drives um, just like the cheap basic GTEC mobile one and two terabyte drives those are super reliable um, the only ones I really tell clients to stay away from are, are Lacey and Seagate drives who owns Lacey. Um, those are really failure prone. Uh, I think there's a lot of like hubris with those where because they have that orange bumper on them and they're mm -hmm. called rugged, people think they can kind of throw them around and that's really not the case. Um, Seagate and, and Backblaze, the uh, cloud storage company I mentioned, they're really great about being transparent uh, with their data management practices and every quarter they actually publish this really detailed report of um, their drive statistics and the drive failure statistics. And they'll say, we have X number of this manufacturer and this model and X number of this model. And across the board, year after year after year, uh, the Seagate drives have had the highest failure rate of all. Um, and that's what's inside of Lacey. Uh, and I've just, I, I've only ever had Lacey hard drives fail on me. I've, I've had six or seven of them fail on me on set. Yeah. And I really am trying to push people to stop using those and switch over to SSDs because not only are they faster, but they're also way more reliable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it makes a, life easier all around. Yeah. Cause for maybe people that don't understand what SSD drive is from my knowledge, it's a solid state drive. Whereas the older drives, you hear that it has the spinning where right. it's, there's like a component that's spinning and with the SSD drive, it doesn't have that. So that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. You can think of an SSD as basically like a giant, compact flash card with a USB cable, you know, and, and that is essentially, you know, what's inside the technologies uh, progress a little bit, but um, yeah, no moving parts. You can, I tell people you can throw this across the room against the wall and it'll be fine. Um, hmm. So, you know, yeah. And uh, how has obviously the last year has been crazy for a lot of reasons, um, obviously with COVID-19 and um, trying to adjust to that, like working in a pandemic. Um, what are kind of some of the challenges uh, you've had to handle? Because looking at your website, your office offering like live streaming services. I don't even if that's like a technology you had knowledge of prior to the pandemic or how, how has this kind of the last year of kind of approaching work been for you, I guess? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the streaming has definitely been the biggest change of all. Um, that was something that I had virtually no knowledge about going into COVID, but very quickly recognized was going to become a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I tried to learn about it quickly. And I, I got, I mean, I think the first, first like March and April were pretty slow and nobody really knew what was going to happen. And then kind of by May, I think we kind of figured out, okay, like we're, this is here to stay. We're going to have to go back to work somehow crew back then the biggest thing that people were talking about was reducing crew sizes so i figured okay a lot of people are going to be remoting in obviously clients still have to be able to see what's going on um so i pretty quickly like set up the streaming setup um and just kind of you know there, i didn't really have a blueprint to work off of so i just tried to figure out like what would be the best solution um 
as usual, ended up building a rig that was like way overkill and too complicated. <laughs> and I did one job on it and it's like, wow, I need a whole other second operator just to run this. Um, so then we scaled it back pretty considerably, um, basically switched from using real cameras to just using iPads as, as cameras. That was kind of the big, the big switch that happened. And uh, that's kind of the setup I've been using ever since. And that's become pretty standard. I mean, not every job, but I'd say 80% of my jobs have some sort of streaming component. Now um, I'm feel really good that I uh, kind of jumped on that early because I, I feel like I got, I got that out there with my brand and I've been hired on a number of jobs specifically because I know the streaming, like a couple of bigger name photographers I work with who have uh, a tech that they primarily work with who they really like. Um, and I'm not going to ever, you know, step on anyone's toes if they yeah. have a good working relationship with somebody. But um, a lot of those guys don't know the streaming. So they, you know, if that photographer gets a job where the client wants a robust live streaming setup, they come to me and they say, all right, like I need you. Um, so yeah, that, that's been really good. Um, yeah. So that's been the biggest change. I think the, the next biggest change has just been like, the volume of work and the types of jobs I'm looking for. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I'm pretty like COVID sensitive myself. I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to be as safe as possible. So respect, I've become, man, I respect it. <laughs> um, I've become a lot more selective about what jobs I'm taking. I'm trying to really prioritize like higher rate, bigger jobs and mm -hmm. doing fewer days per month on set rather than just kind of saying yes to everything. Um, so I yeah, it's tough. It's tough, man, not to cut you off. But it's like I worked on a, some jobs this year where some companies took it like super serious and there was like testing and there was like a COVID mm -hmm. manager and it was like they were like really diligent about what they're doing. And then there was like other companies who was like it was a big company, like company that everyone knows, but they were running like a loose ship. And it was mm -hmm. this, I remember other assistants looking at each other like, what the fuck is going on right yeah. now? <laughs> like, it's crazy. Yeah. Not to, I won't name any names, but there's definitely a couple of producers I've worked with um, this past year that I will not be working with again because I was not satisfied with the, uh, the you know, how seriously they took the COVID safety protocols. Yeah. Um, for the last few months, I have been very strict about requiring testing on all jobs. I haven't been taking any jobs that aren't testing a whole crew. I think that's a really important step to keeping people safe. Uh, I know a number of people who have gotten COVID on set, uh, when that hasn't been happening, I've been on a number of sets where we have had talent or crew test positive. Uh, so you know that when that's not happening, there are definitely positive people out there. Um, so, you know, th I, I think that's something the industry has been really good at adapting to, uh, mm -hmm. especially over the last couple of months with this huge spike we've been having. Um, I haven't really had to turn down much because they're not testing. Pretty much everyone that's been reaching out to me has been ha had some sort of testing. So really happy to see how everybody's adapted to that. Definitely. Um, and it's, it's a live streaming thing. Hopefully this uh, COVID thing like gets better, like in the next oh, shit, this year, hopefully, but hopefully <laughs> do, do you think the live streaming is like a, is something you'll try to keep marketing going forward? Cause I think, I think uh, the interesting thing about this pandemic is that like obviously zoom and like video chat has just become like commonplace now. And I think it's mm -hmm. gonna be like an avenue that a lot of businesses are going to keep utilizing, even when the pandemic's over is, is a live streaming thing. Some of you think you'll kind of, try to keep pushing as like a service absolutely yeah i think it's here to stay um whether or not i'll be pushing it i don't know about that i mean it, it's something that like i'm happy i i'm i'm glad it exists i'm glad we're doing it but in in honesty i'd probably rather not be having to worry about it on top of like all the other stuff i already have to worry about mm -hmm. um i think i think there's a lot of debate about this i think a lot of people recognize that now brands and agencies realize they can save a lot of money by not flying people to set at the same time, I think a lot of people, especially people who work at agencies, have that job because they like traveling for work and and traveling to these shoots is like a big perk of their job that I think if if they were able to do it, they wouldn't necessarily give it up. Yeah. So I do think that the streaming is going to I think it's going to be a hybrid approach where like, you know, in a year or two when we're back to normal whenever or whenever that is, you probably will have like an agency art director on set. You might have a couple clients on set, but then maybe like there's somebody in Europe that wouldn't have ever considered like coming to the shoot two years ago, but now they want to be involved. And, mm -hmm. and it's so easy for us to just like set up a, a zoom link for them. So um, 
yeah, I, I think the streaming thing is definitely going to be here to say in some capacity moving forward. Have you worked on these like remote shoots? Because I've seen like GQ did a remote shoot where the photographer was in New York and then the shoot was happening. Mm -hmm. Have you kind of dabbled in any of that stuff? Oh, yeah. I have actually have two of those coming up this week. Um, I, I've done a few so far, too. I had um, a few months ago, I had a, a big car shoot uh, for I can't, I can't say for who, but big car shoot where the photographers were in Sweden. And obviously couldn't travel. This was when, you know, travel restrictions were still really tight and they could not make it to the U S. So, uh, we set up a remote link for them. And then we actually had like a local, uh, photographer who was on set, who just kind of ended up being the camera operator. Um, but you know, they were the, the photographers in Sweden were doing all the direction. Uh, we had multiple like live views of set for them to be able to see what was happening so they could direct light and all that stuff too. Um, so yeah, I've done a few of those. They're they're becoming pretty common. I think they're really cool. I think they work. I think it's it's I, I don't think it's necessarily something that's gonna like reduce the quality of the final product. Mm -hmm. Um I haven't had any photographers, any remote photographers who have said like, wow, I hated this. You know, it, it's <laughs> gone, it's gone pretty smoothly. I think it's a really cool way of working. Yeah, it's, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Like I know some guys I've talked to are like shipping cameras, and then there's like they'll just like have people setting it up and then other people mm -hmm. I just interviewed uh Jay Lennard who's a, a entertainment photographer in New York uh and he did a whole cover shoot for the Hollywood Reporter last month and what he did he he took the brand new iPhone and instead of shooting photos they they were sh just shooting uh 1080 like or, or 4k video on the phone mm -hmm. and then taking stills from that which I found was interesting yeah, that seems like the for the for the fully fully remote shoots where you don't have anyone except talent on set. The FaceTime thing is, seems like the approach a lot of people have been taking, and I think that's cool. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I thought that those fully remote jobs were going to be way more common. Oh no, do you lose the video again? Yeah, it's all right. Let me let me, uh, let me get it back on. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Think, all right, we let back. Me start that thought yeah. over. <laughs> At, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought that these fully remote shoots were going to be way more common. So uh, my friend Alexandra Gavile, who I mentioned, and I uh, got together remotely <laughs> and uh, tried to figure out a way that we could set up a kit that could just be like dropped at a location that talent could set up with no assistance. And she and I could be fully remote, directing, capturing. Um, and one of the things I wanted to accomplish with that setup was like using a real camera and ending up with a raw file. Cause I mm -hmm. think one of the things that I, at, at least the very beginning when people had no idea how to do this and everyone was literally doing FaceTime screenshots, I was like, the quality is just not there. Yeah. I thought it told a really cool story of the moment. And I thought that like um, a lot of the editorial jobs that were happening fully remotely are gonna be like really cool historical like documents um, of this time period. But I was like, this is not sustainable. Um, this is not an aesthetic that's going to last a long time. Let's try and up the quality here. So we did devise a system where we send talent like an actual, you know, 5D Mark IV uh, with a laptop and a really easy way of just setting that up with like no experience. Um, and we did a few of these like fully remote shoots and they, I think they turned out really cool. Um, I think I have a couple of them on my Instagram, maybe if you want to oh, check really? them out, but, um, or, and Alexandra definitely does too at Alexandra Gavile. But um, yeah, we, we thought this was going to be more of a thing. A few clients did end up approaching us about doing some of these remote shoots. But I mean, by the time that was really gaining traction, we were all kind of starting to get back on set again. This was around like June or July when, when things were starting to pick back up. So um, never really went anywhere with any like paid work, but um, it was a fun project. It was a cool thing to like keep me busy during quarantine to figure out how to no, I definitely. Yeah. And it seems like you, you love like problem solving. Like you said, like totally. you're on computer together, this kind of figuring stuff out and this kind of keeps it interesting and kind of, uh, yeah, keep it fun, you know? Absolutely. Uh, one shoot I was excited to talk to you. You kind of mentioned like work with Mark Seliger. You got to work on the Oscars shoot where they kind of, for what I understand, they kind of basically like build a set. Like, um, I don't know where they do it, but and they shoot all the people like they're one Oscars or kind of at the event, I guess. Right. Yeah, so that um, it's at the Vanity Fair after party. So yeah. Vanity Fair, Fair sponsors it. Mark's been doing this for five or six years now, or maybe even a little longer. Um, he's just some context. He has a contract with Condé Nast and shoots for Vanity Fair a lot. So um, 
yeah, uh, this was the first year that I said yes to that job. I, I'd been approached about it a few times in the past. Um, were you like, oh, yeah, were here you, it is. You were just kind of hesitant about it or? Yeah, you know, this it, this is it's the hardest job I've ever done and uh, probably will forever be the hardest job I've ever done. I had heard a lot of stories about that shoot from past first assistants of Mark's who had done it in the past. Um, especially for the digital tech, it's a tough job because uh, Vanity Fair is really trying to push all these photos like immediately. Yeah. Um, and you don't know who you're going to get. There's no schedule. They just kind of pull people as they're coming into the event. Um, so on the fly, you have to do all this file naming with like the celebrity names and make sure everything's spelled correctly and organized and all of that. Um, which, you know, without a shot list at the beginning of the day, when you're managing like a hundred different shoot folders can be, and, and, you know, it's like two minutes per person and then the next one's in. So um, yeah, because like normally on a shoot, if you had an idea of what you're going to shoot you beforehand, you kind of organize what your folders are going to be and file right. naming. But with this, it's kind of really working on the fly, right? Yeah. And my normal workflow is to set all that up as much as possible before we even start shooting. And that's just not possible here. And I do have somebody next to me from Vanity Fair saying, OK, this is this person. This is this person, which helps. But anyways, I had, I had heard that this was a really hectic job in the past and I and I just in all honesty, was like, you know what? I don't think I'm ready for this. I don't, I, I don't, I want to do a good job. Mm-hmm. I don't want to like be the guy that messes this up. I just don't think I'm ready. And they had a really, you know, experienced tech from industrial color that did this every year. Um, so finally, finally last year, they approached me about this job. I said, yeah, let's do it. I gotta, I gotta have the experience. So glad I did because I don't think this is going to happen again for a while <laughs> with COVID and everything. And it was, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really glad I had this opportunity to work on this. But um, yeah, so it's at the Vanity Fair after party, which is in Beverly Hills. They, they basically shut down a whole street and put up this giant tent. Um, and we have a small, you know, maybe 200 square foot area off to the side where they build this. This set. one's great with Spike Lee. That one yeah, was. right. Wasn't that, that was awesome. I love it. And this was right after Kobe died. Uh, so that I thought that outfit was really cool. Yeah. Really fitting. Um, but yeah, they build this set. It's, it's a fairly large, you know, it's probably a 15 by 15 set with a lot of different elements in it. So um, Mark can kind of place people in different areas. And in, in the past, um, they lit it all with strobe and the assistant would kind of Hollywood a big Allen Chrome wow. and move with, with move. And, and like, you know, that sounded like just awful for 10 yeah. hours holding a you gotta be like Chrome. You gotta be like Jack but, to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this year we did something a little different. We had, it was all continuous light with these led panels, um, behind all these windows and we had uh, an actual like board operator who was kind of adjusting levels and color temperature and everything, wow. uh, which made everything go so, I mean, I wasn't there to see what it was like before with my own eyes, but it seemed like everything went a lot smoother because of that, because we could kind of place somebody and then Mark would be like, okay, 80% warm um, and just dial that light. Um, wow, you got, you guys did so many setups, like how, from like start to finish from the point of like shooting, like how long were you guys shooting for um, so let me think about this. So we, we came in the day before mm-hmm. set everything up and then came around around 1 PM the day of the party and just kind of, you know, finished dialing everything, did our final tests. The party started around like nine, I think, but people started to slowly trick in a little, trickle in a little before that. Um, but then it was full on from like 9 PM to one 30 in the morning. And then we had to break down. So the whole day I got out of there at like 4 a.m. It ended up being like a 12 hour day, I think. Wow. Um, or even longer. Yeah. And it, had you it, worked it with, ended up being like a 14 hour day. Had you worked with Mark prior to this? Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, I've been working with Mark since 2015. Um, he was my, he was really like my big break. You know, I, I'd been doing some light teching for some smaller photographers. I was freelancing through a digital capture company in New York here and there. Um, But Mark's first assistant at the time was good friends with my roommate and uh, they worked on some film projects together. And my roommate had always kind of casually mentioned like, oh, my roommate's a digital tech. So finally, after like six months of hounding him, they they hired me on a job um, and I thought I did terrible. And I thought they were never going to call me again. And then they called me the next week. Why do you think Um, you did terrible? Just out of curiosity. I think it was just a lack of confidence. Uh, mm-hmm. I was pretty young in my career. I had never worked with somebody as nearly as big as Mark before. So I don't think I said one word to him all day. I was very intimidated. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to be kind of, you know, his assistant had to hold my hand a little bit with just kind of adapting to his shooting style, which now, of course, I understand is a pretty normal thing for your first day working with somebody. But mm-hmm. um, 
I was just really intimidated. I was like 22 years old working with this huge photographer that I had respected and admired for a really long time. And um, it was just kind of surreal. And uh, I guess I did a good job because they kept hiring me back and I'm still working with Mark to this day. I've got a job uh, hopefully coming up with him in a couple months out here in LA. Mm -hmm. Um, I still do some consulting work for him. He's one of my favorite people to work with. Um, Really great guy. Um, When you say consulting, what type of stuff does that entail? Oh, mostly like uh, equipment. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you know, if they're, they're looking to like upgrade uh, their own digital setup in their studio right now. So I'm just kind of building out that list for them and making sure it all gets set up properly. And do you find like, that's one thing, like, uh, I mean, it happens to me sometimes like people just hit you up because you have this knowledge of technical stuff and they almost expect it for free. Like, Mm -hmm. how do you balance that of like, you know, your, your knowledge is like how you make money. And it's like Mm -hmm. this weird thing, like where people hit you up for advice. Like, how do you handle that? I guess. It totally depends, man. I mean, like you you mentioned my blog before, I mean, the whole reason that I started that blog and like the whole reason I'm even on Instagram is because when I started out as a tech, I felt like there was this huge, like lack of resources for digital techs. I had no mentor. I had like very few places I could go to learn like, you know, what a tech even does. So I kind of made it my mission to like provide some of those resources for younger people who want to get into this. Mm -hmm. Um, at least that's what I set out to do. Um, I'm not doing so much of that anymore now that I'm just like so busy on set and don't necessarily have the time to like sit and answer a bunch of DMs all day. But like when people hit me up with a question here or there about a camera, I always love, you know, trying to be helpful and and yeah. answering those small questions. Um, that's never a problem for me, especially through Instagram. It's just like casual. Um, if it's like a bigger photographer who wants to like really build out a studio or like ha- has questions that are going to take a oh, while wow. more than an hour of my time, then I say, yeah, great. Happy to help. Here's my consulting rate. You know, it, it's a case by case basis. I'm yeah. Is that, is that like running a business? Do you think, cause like looking at your very, like looking at your Instagram and looking at your, your website, it's very professional, very well put together is like running a business and kind of working as like an independent person. Is that something that kind of um, took you a while to kind of, learn or is it something that's kind of continually evolving kind of operating a business you think always evolving absolutely you know i because i went to school for photography i am a, that's what i know you know I, I haven't taken a business class i don't i i'm not like i'm not a natural born businessman but at the end of the day i am running a business that is what being a tech is and and being a photographer too i mean we're all running a business here um I'm very lucky that my, my dad does have an MBA and was, you know, worked in the corporate world for uh, in upper management for a long time. So when I have really specific questions, I have somebody to turn to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's been obviously the biggest struggle for me for my whole career. It's like, I, I feel like I'm really good at what I do on set and like my actual job, but the whole running the business thing, all the accounting, yeah. um, that's something I don't have a ton of knowledge with. I think I've learned a lot just by doing it over the last few, you know, six years, but um, definitely. Yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey. Absolutely. Um, another thing, uh, tech tech question, uh, like uh, calibrating monitors. How often should people be doing this? Uh, what's your kind of approach, mm-hmm. I guess? <laughs> uh, well, I think the general answer there is less often than you might think. Okay. Um, for me, like I think it's important to understand that a monitor calibration is going to be affected by your ambient lighting. So I tend to calibrate my monitors like as long as I, I I keep a pretty standard calibration on all my monitors, but if I have an extra five minutes at the beginning of the day, yeah, I'm going to calibrate my monitors. If I'm in a new studio or in in a new environment where the light's different. Um, I think if you have a monitor that lives on your desk at home and you have pretty consistent light in your office space, um, every three to six months is probably a good call. I mean, the whole point of recalibrating a monitor is that as you put the hours on it, um, there's going to be subtle shifts in like brightness of each of those pixels and, and color rendition. So that's really what like a recalibration, a recalibration is more accounting for age than anything in that situation. And I think like all those calibration programs default their recalibration warning to like one month. And I think that's way, way too often. I really, you know, as long as that monitor is not moving, I think you can get away with cal- recalibrating every three to six months. Nice. And um, in terms of like file naming, we kind of talked about a little bit, but like, what's your approach to that? Because obviously a lot of these shoots, you're uh, shooting tons of different setups, different Mm -hmm. people, uh, different products, whatever it may be. Like, what are some, what's your kind of approach to file naming and just keeping yourself organized, I guess? Sure. So I'd say roughly half the time, maybe a little bit more often, that's not my call. That's dictated by the client. 
Mm -hmm. and I'll receive like a spec sheet before the shoot, which is like, this is how we want the files named. Sometimes that'll go into as much detail as like, here's the SKUs of all the products that needs to be in the file name. Um, so I think it's really important for text to be able to just know how to do all different kinds of file naming and use all the tokens in Capture One really effectively so that you can like just know what to do in those situations where you are presented with something that's like a 40 character long file naming scheme. Mm -hmm. um, but if, I, if I'm not given that, um, usually I kind of default to like a name underscore folder name underscore counter setup where mm -hmm. you have a general project name, which might be like the date plus talent or date plus client, or if, you know, some photographers have like internal job IDs that they use for every job, whatever. And then um, I like to have a, you know, my default is like, look one, look two, look three, but that might change depending on the situation. That's the folder. Um, sorry, I got a truck going by outside. You're good. I think it froze there, George. Can you hear me? Personally, I like to keep the, the big thing that I kind of, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You froze there for a second. Oh, wait. Whoops. Sorry. It might be mine. It's still working. Okay, cool. Yeah. You're, you're still fine. I'm, I'm getting you. So sorry about that. Cool, um, cool. Let me back up a little bit. Um, yeah. So I like to start off with like a job name or something that's kind of descriptive of the whole project. And then the folders might be look one, look two, look three. That's kind of the standard, but situation might dictate something different. That's more descriptive there. And then the big thing that I really like to do um, is, unless I'm told otherwise, I like to keep the, the counter at the end of the file name continuously running through the whole job so that the first shot of the day is, you know, 0001. And then in folder 15, at the end of the day, you're like 2,867, you know, and that way, uh, I think that's a really nice way for clients or whoever to edit and make a list of selects without having to list like an entire file name because you know, full image 1,873 is going to be the only image 1,873, regardless of whatever folder it's in. Mm -hmm. um, some clients dictate that you reset the counter every time you go to a new folder. And in that situation, it, I think it can sometimes get a little confusing where like, if you have file number 137, that could be from look three or look eight or look 12 or whatever. Um, so I just always like to be thinking about like, okay, if my, my biggest like workflow consideration is, okay, if this file gets taken out of this folder accidentally and moved somewhere else on the hard drive or like to a completely different hard drive or something, how are you going to know just by looking at the name where to put it back? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It gets out of control when you're shooting like thousands, ten thousands of photos in a day. It, get, it can get out of hand totally. real, real quick. Uh, totally. <laughs> and, and, then, and, just, and then more than anything, just consistency. So like, I didn't talk about it, but my session naming is always the same. My session naming is always date starting with the year, four digits, underscore, photographer's initials, underscore, client, underscore, job name. So when I go back to a hard drive, even if I'm sorting by name, all of my shoots are also sorted by date. Yeah. And also being that we live in this age of like everything's content, content, content shoots, they'll have still shoots, there's video. Sometimes people will just be shooting with the iPhone for like BTS or whatever, mm -hmm. or social stuff. Do you end up on some of your shoots having to deal with motion um, assets or how does that kind of work? So if at all, sometimes um, I would say more, that was more common when I was living in New York than it is out here. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time it's either a small BTS crew that's going to like handle their own card dumps or we're like piggybacking on a huge motion crew that has their own DIT, you know? Um, so every once in a while, someone will say, Hey, do you mind dumping some, some video cards? Of course, no problem. But um, not something I have to do very often uh, when I do, you know, if you have a lot of like mixed media on one job, I'll usually at the very top folder level before even the session, I'll separate that into like stills, video, BTS, or whatever the different, you know, mediums are. Yeah. Um, so that it's really clear on that drive that like, okay, I want the video, go to the video folder. Yeah. And I guess like, uh, start wrapping up, like, wh where do you, where do you see this? Where do you want to take this thing, man? Like you kind of got any goals for what you, obviously you've accomplished a lot and gotten to work on a lot of cool projects, mm -hmm. but like, what are you hoping to work on for, for your work and moving forward, I guess? Um, I mean, that, yeah, it's, it's always a tough question to answer. I'm like kind of taking, I'm going wherever the wind's taking me. But um, like I said earlier, I th I've always kind of wanted to own a rental house type situation, um, maybe a small studio rental house combo. That's a tough market out here. It's so saturated in LA. Um, but 
I mean, right now what I'm working on is kind of expanding my company out. So it's more than just me. Um, I've got a couple, I, I've got about three kits worth of gear that I could reasonably send out at the same time. So I've got a few freelancers on my roster that, you know, I'm always trying to say yes to as much as possible. So, oh, so you'll have it, like digi techs that kind of under your umbrella kind of. Yeah. I have this situation next week where I I'm like fully double booked for all days next week on two different jobs. So I'm sending out a freelancer with my kit on the other job. And, you know, I'm still providing some service on the back end with all the logistics and the payroll and all of that. Um, but you know, the, the freelancer is going to make the date rate, my kits working and making money for me. Um, so, you know, trying to expand more into that where ideally I'm working three or four or five jobs at a time and playing a little bit more of a managerial role, yeah. um, kind of goes hand in hand with my desire to like spend less time on set with COVID, uh, you know, and all those considerations. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, th I think that's kind of the more immediate goal for me is to become a little bit more of, of the boss and be like training yeah. and sending out other people who I know are going to like tech to my standards um, and prioritizing going out more on like the bigger, higher budget jobs myself. That would be a cool avenue to go down. Like people that want to be digi techs, but don't have as much knowledge. Like, I don't know, you could teach courses if you wanted, because I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really know anything about, I don't, I've never really heard of like digi tech courses really. I mean, there's <laughs> photo school, but even photo yeah. school, like they didn't really even teach us what a digi tech was. No, but, totally. Yeah. They didn't teach me that. I will yeah. mention there is one kind of digi tech course. It's the phase one certification program. Mm -hmm. um, that has changed a lot over the last few years. It's not necessarily something that I, think is like required reading necessarily for digital techs anymore it used to be um it's out there i mean digital transitions i don't know if you're familiar with them but they're a phase one dealer yeah. who does a lot of events i've done a few of their classes that have been really useful um but i mean yeah you're right there isn't really like one go-to place to like learn to be a tech so i i get approached all the time by kids who are you know fresh out of college or maybe have done a couple years of assisting who like want to tech and want to learn Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've definitely done some training like that before. And it's good for me too, because it, you know, the more people that come to me like that, the more of a talent pool I have to look at to be like, oh, wow, like, I think you've got a lot of potential. I want to keep working with you and send you out on some jobs and definitely you know, keep teaching you. Yep. Um, so no, that's yeah. good, man. Any photographers like on your bucket list you haven't worked with yet that you're hoping oh, to work man. with or anything like that? <laughs> There's a few. I think uh, number one's got to be Pari Dukovic. I think Pari's okay. work is really incredible. His lighting's really incredible. I'm yeah, he was the one who did that GQ cover all the yeah. which was which was pretty wild. Yeah, right. That was cool. His setup for that was cool too. And I'm I'm pretty good friends with a couple of his assistants out here. So I'm like, oh man, gotta get on that crew. Um, Art Striber is another big one. I know his crew is pretty established, but Art, if you hear this, would love to work with you sometime. Good dude. Um yeah, th those are those are the two like really big ones that I'm like, oh, I want to work with you so bad. Um, yeah. But again, I, I just really like working with as many people as possible and as many perspectives as possible from this. I mean, I used to teach high school students at, at NYU. We had like a, a summer program for high school students. Mm -hmm. And um, my favorite thing about it is that all the high school kids like didn't know the rules. So they broke all the rules. Yeah. And I think that led to like some really creative work. And so I really, really, you know, all these big name people are great, but I really, really like working with younger photographers who are more at the beginning of their career because I think they have a lot of ideas and don't necessarily know how to execute. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun to come in and kind of be that person who takes the idea and is like, whoa, that's awesome. Like, let's let's make it happen. Um, so that excites me just as much as like watching somebody who really knows what they're doing work. Yeah, definitely, man. Well, George, dude, it was a real pleasure. I'm glad we did yeah, this. Thanks, uh, Alex. Me I, too. For Digitech, uh, I like I said before, man, Digitech, so look at, they're like the point guard of the job, mm -hmm. man. You look to them, they're kind of run, helping run the ship and steer it and keep everything organized. So it was a real pleasure kind of hearing your journey with everything. Uh, so I can't thank you enough, man. No, thank you. This was a lot of fun. And for people that if they're looking for a Digitech, I don't know if they're in LA or wherever, uh, where's the best place for them to go to contact you? Sure. Uh, brooksdigi.com is my website. Uh, a lot of information on there. Um, my Instagram is at brooksdigi. I uh, got a lot of, you know, work requests through there too. So, you know, any, either of those places are, are great. Perfect, man. I'll link it and uh, yeah, we can just cut it there, man. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. So there you have it. Uh, that was the George Brooks interview. 
Uh, just want to thank George so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, I've been looking forward to having a digital tech on the podcast for a long time. Um, so I know I learned a lot just kind of hearing about um, his experience working as a digital tech and everything goes in everything that goes into his work. It's a uh, really incredible stuff. Um, definitely go check out George's website at brooksdigi.com as well as his Instagram at brooksdigi. Um, he's based in the Los Angeles area, but I know um, he, he uh, works with photographers all over. Um, so definitely go check out his work. Um, lots of cool stuff up there and uh, whatnot. And he's always posting up good information on his Instagram as well with like uh, tech info and um, this kind of behind the scenes photos from different shoots he's working on. So definitely go give him a follow. And as always, I'll be having weekly podcasts every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as the Photo Banter YouTube page. So definitely go um, hit the subscribe button up on our YouTube. It'd be much appreciated. And as always, thanks so much for listening and take care.